Good morning. It is Tuesday, the first of November. I'm Richard Parr, and you are watching Sportachino. We are live every single weekday morning on Facebook Live and on YouTube. Thanks for joining the show. Let's start the day with our morning headlines. Wilfred Bonny scores his first two goals for Stoke City against his former club Swansea in a 3-1 win on Monday night. In the NFL, Jay Cutler returned for the Chicago Bears as they beat the Minnesota Vikings 2010. Jockey Freddie Talisky is in intensive care with suspected spinal injuries after a fall at Kempton. While Almandin, ridden by Karen McAvoy, has won Australia's most popular race, the Melbourne Cup. I just want to tell you that today's show is sponsor free. We're doing it from the goodness of our hearts. If you want to help support our show, please buy some merchandise at sportachino.com. If you would like to be a sponsor, drop us an email, sportsdesk at sportachino.com. It's a huge night of Champions League football. We'll be getting into all of that with Kevin Hatchard a little bit later in the show. But every single morning on our Twitter page, at Sportachino, we discuss some of the big stories of sport. And the one which is happening today is all about England and Scotland not being allowed to wear poppies when they face each other on November the 11th in a World Cup qualifier on Armistice Day. Poppies to remember everything which happened in the war. And FIFA normally ban any political messages or gestures or commercial sponsors on shirts and they're saying that they won't be allowed to wear poppies. And England apparently are trying to find out what would be the punishment if they were to do this. They did it in 2011, I think it was against Spain when they played Spain and they actually got around it by using it as a poppy on an armband. What do you think of all of that? Let us know. Let us know in today's poll on the Sportachino page. It's pinned to the top of the page. Let's take a look at it. It is, should England and Scottish FA players be allowed to wear poppies? That result was taken a little bit earlier, 100% of you saying yes. I think that is changing. Take a look at the Twitter page for the latest scores and results on that poll. In fact, get involved. Let me know on the hashtag Sportachino. You know, this is quite a passionate subject that a lot of you are very close to your heart. So let us know what you think about that. Or are FIFA actually right? Are FIFA in the right saying, look, you know, we have no political or religious gestures and it should be the same rule for everyone else. Let me know your thoughts on the Twitter page. Should England and Scotland players be allowed to wear poppies? We would love to get your thoughts on that. This morning on Sportachino. So today, that was the poll today. Let's have a look at the result of yesterday's poll. That was our Chelsea Premier League title contenders this season. They've won four straight Premier League games. Their last win coming against Southampton at the weekend on Sunday. Hazard and an absolute beauty from Diego Costa making it 2-0 there. And it's a pretty close poll result, but 53% of you think Chelsea are Premier League title contenders. You've got City up there right now. You've got Liverpool up there right now. You've got Arsenal up there right now. Could other teams get involved? Could Manchester United start to improve? And, you know, they just didn't score against Burnley. Heaton had to make 11 saves. Could that be the difference? Could they start to kickstart their season soon? Could they be involved? It's a really exciting Premier League title race. And most of you think that Chelsea are contenders this season. So that's the results of our polls. Let's take a look at the football for tonight. So it is a huge night in the UEFA Champions League. There's eight games in all. Let's have a look at them. In Group A, it's Basel against PSG. PSG won that game two weeks ago, 3-0. And if Paris Saint-Germain and Arsenal win, Arsenal are away at Ludogorets. They go through, or actually all that matters is that one doesn't lose. Arsenal, when they faced Ludogorets, they won that game 6-0 when they met at the Emirates. Arsenal, of course, 14 matches unbeaten. But this is an interesting statistic. They've lost three of their last five European away matches. In Group B, Napoli missed the chance to make history in the last match day, 
being the first team to go through after three matches. That's because they lost to Besiktas. Besiktas are now one point behind Napoli after that win in that last match. They Napoli, of course, lost to Juve at the weekend. Benfica against Dynamo Kiev. Benfica won 2-0 away when they last met, although it was Kiev who won this fixture last season. Group C, Borussia Mönchengladbach against Celtic. If Celtic lose and City get a point, the Scottish team can't qualify. Mönchengladbach won that 2-0 last time. Man City against Barcelona. We'll be talking more about that in just a moment with Kevin Hatchard. A draw is enough to see Barca through. Barca 100% record so far. And in Group D, Atletico Madrid versus Rostov. Atletico won that 1-0 last time round. Carrasco with the goal. They've also got a 100% record. While Bayern Munich, they faced PSV Eindhoven in Holland. Bayern won that 4-1 last time. They are, of course, the Bundesliga leaders. Well, one man who knows a lot about the Bundesliga is the football commentator, Kevin Hatchard. And to help us look ahead to all of these big matches, Kevin now joins me live this morning on Sportachino. Kevin, welcome to the show. Delighted to be here. Good morning. Good morning. So, Kevin, we'll start with the game which everyone is really interested in. It is, of course, Manchester City against Barcelona. Now, we were speaking yesterday with Evgeny Klopov, talking about the tactics, whether Guardiola should play a back three, whether he'll play Aguero. What do you think he might do tonight? I think certainly he'll play Aguero. Uh, I think there were a few raised eyebrows when he was left out of the game uh, in Catalonia. And, uh, of course, it didn't work, as it turned out, as they were uh, dismantled 4-0. Uh, I think he knows, Guardiola, that he needs to make a bit of a statement tonight because uh, it's one thing trying to just get a result against Barcelona, but I think he feels he needs to vindicate his style, his way of doing things. Uh, after the defeat to Barcelona, which was so heavy, he was questioned about his, ta his tactics, his way of doing things. And he said, look, I've won 21 trophies this way. I'm not going to change now. I believe in what we're doing. And I think he wants to make a big statement tonight. Do you believe in what he's doing? Does he need to adapt his style for the English game at all? No, I think you have to bear in mind that City uh, are top of the table in the Premier League. And he's only been with the players just a few weeks, really. Uh, it will take time for them to adapt to what he's trying to do. Um, but I... I thoroughly believe in what he's doing. I mean, he's had massive success at Barcelona. Uh, at Bayern Munich, yes, he didn't win the Champions League, but he got deep into that tournament season after season after season. And he won the Bundesliga in all three seasons as well. I think he improved the Bayern Munich squad. I think those players now are more adaptable. I think they're uh, more intelligent in terms of how they manage games. Uh, and I think he certainly left Bayern in a, in a better state than when he found them. Uh, so... I think if he maintains those methods at City, they will they will come good. I think he makes good players better. I think the likes of Kevin De Bruyne uh, will really uh, flourish under him. Uh, and I think we've seen already with Aguero, you know, 13 goals in 13 games. Um, and even though he was left out against Barcelona, I think he's done fairly well. Yeah, let's talk a little bit more about that. He was dropped for that game and... You know, to me, that just screams of a tactical decision. And then you hear all these stories in the papers and people giving the opinion that Guardiola doesn't rate him and everything like that. But he put him straight back in the team. I think, for me, it came across as just it was a tactical reason. We've tried to play a false nine. And then after Bravo got sent off, it all kind of fell to pieces. Do you think he rates yeah. Aguero as a player? Of course. Absolutely. And why wouldn't you? The guy's got 50 Premier League goals in the last two seasons. He scores week after week after week. He was sensational against West Brom. Uh, and Guardiola's no fool. You know, there's this, been this long-running thing about how Guardiola doesn't like genuine centre-forwards. Um, and this all stems from the fact that uh, it didn't work out with Zlatan Ibrahimovic. Uh, Samuel Eto'o, he kept him on for a season and he did well. But Eto'o was eventually um, ushered out of the exit door at Barcelona. But if you look at the relationship he had with Robert Lewandowski... It was very fruitful indeed. Lewandowski uh, scored buckets of goals. He was the uh, the top scorer in the Bundesliga last season, the Toyega Canona, uh, as they call that uh, little battle for the top scorer's crown. And uh, I see the same with Aguero. You know, he his systems create lots of chances and centre forwards will thrive in that. I think you're right. I think it was a tactical decision not to select him uh, from the start against Barcelona. But 
he absolutely rates him, no question about that. Yeah. So the other game in Group C is Celtic away at Borussia Mönchengladbach. Of course, you're a German football commentator, so you know lots about this team. Mönchengladbach won that last match 2-0. They're obviously at home this time. Does Celtic stand a chance? They do, but I think they really... It was a real kicker for them to lose that game at home to Borussia Mönchengladbach because the general pattern for Gladbach since Andre Schubert, their coach, took charge is that they have been very, very strong at home and they've struggled away from home. So that was Celtic's big chance in that game at Parkhead. Two mistakes from Colo Torre, punished by Gladbach. Gladbach in uncharted waters to, to an extent because they've gone four games without a Bundesliga win under Andre Schubert for the first time. They've gone four Bundesliga games without even scoring a goal. They were toothless on Friday in a game that I commentated on against Eintracht Frankfurt. But there could be some key team news because Torgan Hazard and Raphael, who are their two best attacking players, they're back in training. And if they start the match, I think Celtic are in trouble. Yeah, another one of the Hazard family. I believe there's a few more youngsters coming through as well. Be interesting to see how they get on. Kevin, we are an interactive show. We are live on Facebook. We're live on YouTube. We've got a comment here. Just talking again about Sergio Aguero. This is from Archie Burrows. He wants to know from you, Kevin, where do you think Aguero ranks in the list of the best strikers? Is Suarez the only striker better than him in the world? Oh, it's a really good question. It depends on your, your kind of view of what a striker is. If you're talking about a pure centre forward, he'd have to be up there because his domestic record in what is regarded as one of the toughest leagues in the world is sensational. As I say, 50 Premier League goals in the last couple of seasons, uh, under pressure, uh, scoring on a regular basis. I think Lewandowski would have to be up there as well because of his um, consistency, not just at club level, but it's translated to the international stage with Poland as well. Uh, he's been scoring plenty of goals for them too. But I think Aguero would have to be right up there in terms of pure centre-forwards. Let's talk more about Lewandowski's team, Bayern Munich. They're away to PSV Eindhoven in Group D. Atletico face Rostov. Are we expecting Bayern and, Ros uh, Bayern and Rostov? <laughs> Bayern and, and Atletico. That would be a turn of books, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> that would be an upset. Uh, are we expecting Bayern and Atletico to go through to the next round pretty comfortably? Yeah, yeah, we are. But... Um, it was interesting with Bayern because they made this great start under Carlo Ancelotti. They went unbeaten. They won their first uh, eight games, which is a record for a Bayern coach winning his first eight games. Um, but there is a general feeling that in the last few weeks they've been a bit flat. They were beaten 1 0 Atletico uh, on match day two, and that set them back a little bit. Uh, they were very comfortable winners at the weekend away to Augsburg in a Bavarian derby. Arjen Robben's back, scoring goals, making goals. Uh, he's dovetailing well with Robert Lewandowski. Um, so I think Bayern should have enough to beat PSV, who are on a rough run at the moment. Uh, they've only picked up uh, one point in the Champions League so far. Uh, they've only won two of the last seven games. Uh, so they've had a few injury problems as well. I think uh, Narsing's out. Uh, also, uh, Jerome Zut, the uh, first-choice goalkeeper's out. Uh, Jürgen Lockadier as well. So they've got some key players missing. And I would expect Bayern to probably go on and win that one. Atletico are really interesting because uh, we've the narrative has been that they're tough to beat. They eke out these 1-0 wins. But Diego Simeone has very much changed the way they play to an extent this season. They're scoring lots of goals. They uh, put four past Malaga at the weekend. It's the fourth time this season that they've scored four goals or more in a match. So uh, Atletico on really good form right now. Got players like Yannick Ferreira Carrasco playing well. Uh, Kevin Gamero. So... Bit of the pressure taken off Antoine Griezmann, and that really helps. Mm, I thought that was smart by Atletico this week by extending the contract of Carrasco while he's in form, making sure they lock him down. Yeah, um, yeah, and it's, it's the type of decision that's really propelled them forward. They're very, very astute there. Mm. So let's talk a bit more about Bayern Munich for just a minute. And they are top of the Bundesliga, but there is one team which isn't too far behind them, and that's the newly promoted side RB Leipzig and I actually said to you before this interview that it's Red Bull Leipzig and you said you can't actually say that. Do you want to just explain a little bit more about who they are and why out of nowhere are they challenging Bayern Munich at the top of the Bundesliga, Kevin? Yeah, well, they're a divisive club because of how they came about. Um, in 2009, uh, Red Bull had been looking for a club in Germany for some time. 
Uh, they'd looked at San Paoli in uh, Hamburg. That was never going to fly uh, because of uh, San Paoli's fan base. Uh, they'd also uh, looked at uh, potentially uh, taking on clubs elsewhere. In the end, they settled on Leipzig, um, which hasn't had a representative for a long, long time at a decent level. Uh, so the people of Leipzig were happy to take it on board. What they did was they bought a fifth-tier club, Mark Randstadt. Uh, they bought their license. And then through Red Bull funding the whole thing, they've gone up and up the divisions. Uh, and they have made some very sensible decisions. They took on Ralf Hasenhüttl, who I think is one of the best coaches in Germany. He did a brilliant job with Ingolstadt last season in keeping them clear of relegation trouble. So they took him on. Uh, the coach of last season, Ralf Rangnick, moved to sporting director. And they've hired some brilliant young players. You know, Timo Werner's got great pace and he's scoring goals. Oliver Burke's come in uh, from Nottingham Forest for big money, but he's done really well. Naby Keita as well. Um, and they've just got a great coach. They're well coached. They've got uh, a great... Um... <laughs> My son has come to join me here. Oh, welcome. Uh, it's a morning <laughs> breakfast show. How's he doing this morning? Good morning. Doing... How are you? Are you going to say <laughs> Right. So you go on while I carry on talking about Leipzig. Um, and Clearly a passionate so Leipzig done... fan there, Kevin. Uh, well, maybe, maybe. <laughs> Uh, so they've got a good coach, a good sporting director. They've signed some very, very good young players. The reason they're divisive is because there is a fear in German football uh, that they, the way that they have come about, uh, there's one company that's bought the club that is funding the whole thing. That's anathema to German football fans. Also, they have this thing called the 50 plus one rule where effectively no one entity can own more than 50% of the shares. The way Red Bull have got around that is that they have 17 members, all of them are Red Bull employees, and it's very, very expensive to actually get a membership with the club. So there is a fear in German football that it is a threat to the way it is run. The other thing as well is that there have been fan protests when they played a game against Dinamo Dresden uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, Dresden fans threw, threw a uh, severed bull's head uh, onto the pitch, so uh, that didn't go down too well. They've had nails and screws put on the pitch ahead of pre-season friendly. So there is deep, deep, um, you know, feeling about this amongst German football fans. Oh, wow. Very interesting. And of course, you've got all of this kind of hatred towards them, but then you've got teams like Wolfsburg, which are funded by Volkswagen and things like that. So uh, uh, all very interesting there. Let's just return back to the Champions League. Group A, Arsenal away, to, away at Ludogorets. Arsenal on a 14-match unbeaten streak. We're not expecting anything to change there, are we? No, I wouldn't have thought so, although Luda Goretz did give Paris Saint-Germain a bit of a run for their money in Bulgaria. You've got to bear in mind this is a Luda Goretz team that's used to winning. Uh, they've uh, won their last five championships in Bulgaria, so they win season after season after season. Um, but at the Champions League level, as you'd expect, they found it difficult to uh, actually go up a level. Um, Arsenal battered them 6-0 in the reverse game. Luda Goretz were... Surprisingly attacking, refreshingly attacking, really. Um, but it didn't serve them well at all and they were comfortably beaten. So uh, I would expect a, a similar scenario. It was interesting what you said, though, in the build-up. Uh, Arsenal uh, losing three of their last five away games. So they have had one or two dodgy performances away from home. But I think there's a new energy about Arsenal this season. I think there's a consistency. Uh, and I think, um, I think they'll win. Do you think they're genuine title contenders then, if, if there is that difference? Because, you know, last year's, in my opinion, it was theirs to lose. You know, they had the best squad, they had the best players, but they just couldn't get the consistency like Leicester did. Have they made enough changes to this team? You know, they, they brought in Mustafi, they brought in Perez. Are they good enough to really win the title? I think we won't know until February, March, because that's traditionally when it all starts to fall apart for Arsenal. Um, they have this last 16 defeat in the Champions League. That might change if they can win the group, uh, if they can beat Paris Saint-Germain in that big game that's coming up at the Emirates. But the Leicester example is very relevant here because when Arsenal beat Leicester uh, and they were really title contenders, Leicester got stronger and stronger and stronger and Arsenal faded away. And that's the huge question mark against Arsene Wenger's team. Do they have the mental strength to maintain a title push? If they do, then they certainly have the talent to win the league. But will they fall apart again? We've got another comment here on the Facebook page, Kevin. 
talking about De Bruyne and Hazard. Um, Tim here is asking who will come out on top between De Bruyne and Hazard. And then De Bruyne, is he Chelsea's biggest selling mistake? Do you think De Bruyne is Chelsea's biggest selling mistake? I think it was probably a question of, of the wrong timing, I think, because De Bruyne is never going to be the Mourinho kind of player. He's not somebody that's going to do a huge amount of tracking back. He's not somebody necessarily who's massively tactically responsible in, in the sense that he's better if he's given a little bit more freedom. He went to Wolfsburg, he did magnificently well, but they built that team around him and they got the benefits of that. And you only have to have to look at the way Wolfsburg have fallen away since he left to show you just how influential he was. Whether he would have had that impact at Chelsea, I'm not quite sure, but I think he's come back to England a better player, a more confident player, a more rounded player. And I think uh, he will go from strength to strength. I think the talent there is frightening in terms of what he can achieve in the next few years. And Guardiola is the perfect guy to bring that out of him because he will see every nuance of how he plays and he'll be able to tweak things here and there. I think De Bruyne is a terrific player. Mm. I quite like the way Guardiola's kind of using Silva and De Bruyne in that kind of both in a number eight role. That, that's quite an interesting yeah. move he's done there. Kevin, it's been amazing to get your thoughts. We've had so much insight from you this morning. Just before you go, maybe just tell our viewers how they can continue to learn from you using social media or anything else you'd like to talk about this morning. Yeah, I'm on Twitter at uh, Kevin Hatchard. Uh, but uh, the thing I'd like to push really is that uh, we've got regular uh, radio commentaries on the Bundesliga on Bundesliga.com, the official Bundesliga website. We've got five games every weekend. So we've got all the top action and it's uh, free to air on radio at Bundesliga.com. So keep an eye out for that. Superb. We will check that out. Kevin Hatchard, football commentator, thank you so much for your time this morning. Cheers. It was great to get the thoughts of Kevin there. Remember, this show is sponsor-free today. We're doing it from the goodness of our own hearts. If you'd like to help our show, then please help and go and buy some of our merchandise from sportochino.com. Well, if you take a look at the website, you will also see that there's a brand new best in the world t-shirt which you can buy because, of course, I also host the Best in the World with Richard Parr podcast, a brand new podcast coming out tomorrow like it does every Wednesday on iTunes. We'll be talking more about that tomorrow on Sportachino. All right, it's the moment you've all been waiting for. It's time for the Sportachino product review. Bad news, people, I'm eating again. Today, I am eating the Maxi Nutrition Pro Max Sustain and Rebuild Cookie Dough. Dun, dun, dun. Plus, I'm never strong enough to open these. Maybe because I need more protein. Maybe that's the problem. All right. You've got to be strong to open the packet. Oh. All right, what do we got here? Let's see what this bad boy looks like. So chocolate on the outside. Let me tell you a little bit more about this before I eat this. It has got 21 grams of protein. It's got 16.3 grams of carbohydrates. It's 218 calories. They say that they have high quality protein for post-training and they support the rebuilding process because of course you get micro tears that happen in muscles after intense training. And they say that you can support your training goals with a combination of fast acting and slow releasing proteins. But let's just take another look at it. The one interesting thing I, I read just before I try it out 
is if we can just take a look at me one more time. There we go. Here is the bar. The interesting thing it says on the back <laughs> is, and this did make me chuckle. And I, I don't know whether they just have to tell you this or they just do it for the sake of it, but it says may cause laxative effects. Excessive consumption, that is. Excessive consumption may cause laxative effects. So let's give it a try. Oh, it's nice and soft. That's really good. It's really sweet though. It's really sugary. Oh my goodness. It's a bit like eating a Mars bar. It's very tasty, but whoa, I feel like I'm having a sugar high right now. It says it may contain eggs, nuts, and peanuts. Let's try and find out a bit more about the sugar. Now that 8.9% of the grams of the carbohydrates is in sugar. Let's take another look at the ingredients. So we have got, so yeah, sugar, cocoa butter, lots of different things. There's sugar syrup, inverted sugar, sugar syrup. It's very, very sweet. Um, it's tasty, but it's almost too sweet for me. I'm not sure I would buy it. I paid £2.17 for it in a Holland and Barrett. It's not been provided to me. It's an independent review on the Maxi Nutrition Pro Max Sustain and Rebuild, £2.17. So that is today's product review. Let me know what you think about it if you try it out. Let me know what you would like me to try all related to sports, health, and fitness, drop me an email, sportsdesk at sportachino.com, or in the comments page on Facebook because we are live, or on YouTube, or on Twitter. All right, the show has nearly finished again, but let's take a reminder of our morning headlines. Wilfred Bonny scores his first two goals for Stoke City against his former club Swansea in a 3-1 win on Monday night. In the NFL, Jay Cutler returned for the Chicago Bears as they beat the Minnesota Vikings 2010. Jockey Freddie Talisky is in intensive care with suspected spinal injuries after a fall at Kempton. While Almandin, ridden by Karen McAvoy, has won Australia's most popular race, the Melbourne Cup. Tomorrow on Sport of China, we'll be talking to Kenny McIntosh to review WWE Hell in a Cell, the latest pay-per-view offering from the WWE on the WWE Network. Great event, lots to discuss with Kenny. If you've got any thoughts, put them on the Facebook page, put them on the YouTube page, and put them on Twitter at Sport of China. Don't forget, we've got a poll asking you, should England and Scotland players be allowed to wear poppies when they meet on November the 11th on Armistice Day? Join that poll. Let us know in the Facebook page. And also tomorrow, we will look ahead to Wednesday's Champions League matches and we'll look back at the mouth-watering clash between Manchester City and Barcelona, which happens tonight in the Champions League. Well, thank you so much for joining me today on Sportacino. We will be back tomorrow morning from 8 GMT.